Welcome back, everybody, to the second episode of the Richmond Kickers Coaches Corner, where we put two soccer coaches in the same room, and we see what happens. Again, my name is Will Selden, and I am the high school soccer coach portion of this conversation. And joining me once again today is head coach and sporting director of the Richmond Kickers, Darren Swatsky. Darren, we made it to the second week. We're back. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, well, we'll just get right into it. Um, so last week, we focused a little bit on kind of the top of mind stuff surrounding the pandemic and how we're coaching our teams through that. Um, today, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of our coach's journey, if you will, and how we got to where we are. And I think your story might be a little bit longer and more interesting than mine, but um, we'll take some time to share each other's. Um, so I guess my first question to you is, where did you get started? How did this all, how did this all begin for you? Uh, well, I'm from Seattle. Uh, I grew up there and, um, you know, it's really interesting. I, I was playing in a neighbor's yard when I was like six years old and, uh, it turned out that the guy's house that I was at, I was playing with this girl. She was, uh, been a close friend of mine the rest of my life. And I was five or six and he was a soccer coach and I kicked a soccer ball and it was like weird. It was an epiphany happened. I knew I wanted to play. Um, and then I didn't have a soccer coach until I was 17 years old who had played soccer before. Uh, and Wade Weber, who is uh, a coach and former player uh, in the Seattle Sounders organization still, uh, became my high school coach. And that was the summer of the 90 World Cup. Um, and then I ended up going to Europe that summer to play and train for four weeks. And it's just the whole world exploded for me. My gosh. So you said you didn't have a, a coach? that had played before until you were 17. No, I guess I kind of, that kind of, that kind of paints the generational differences, I guess. Well, it's uh, we're, one thing I would say is we're pretty lucky in the Seattle area because there were a lot of former NESL greats like Jimmy Gabriel and Alan Hinton that stayed and settled in, in Seattle. And, and they had a big effect on a lot of people in the area. I just, it was just interesting. Most of the coaches I had had coached other things and I really didn't understand what, what football, soccer was really about until you know wade and then when i moved on to college huh that is really interesting um so you mentioned some names there i, I guess as you kind of moved on started playing and then got into your college years and, and professionally thereafter who were your biggest influences the coaches that had the biggest impact on you uh well clive charles who was a uh, I left back at West Ham and came to the United States, uh, coached me at the University of Portland. Uh, he coached the Olympic teams, the national teams. He, uh, he had a profound uh, uh, impact on me as a, as a person and as a, a player. I mean, he, yeah. he held you accountable on being a man. Character was a big deal, which uh, sadly is lost on a lot of people in sports, to be honest. Um, but what an impact. I mean, he, you had, he had a personal relationship with every person he ever met and that, uh, you know, there are a lot of players that are now coaching and a lot of coaches that had um, time with him that really, you know, they know the impact of him and he was an amazing guy. Yeah. I think one thing that's interesting to think about is um, the generational differences between maybe when you grew up playing and then coaching after that and kind of my generation of growing up. And, and you touch on that a little bit. Being on the coaching side of things now, do you try to replicate kind of the situation that you were in or, or the people that Im impacted you when you were coaching or, or do you try to, you know, go along with the times a little bit more these days? Well, that one's a question we can talk about for a long time. You know, one yeah. of them now is that we're a lot more educated on the game. We've learned a lot from our European counterparts that have been doing it for a hundred years. So just understanding methodology and, and pedagogy, like we talked about before and understanding yeah to teach the game is is way more advanced uh but it's very interesting because i think that there's a little bit of over coaching in a way uh in the age groups where kids learn because you know i would argue that the generation that came before even the development academy and all these kids coming up now there were players that were phenomenal players i mean there's international guys like you know eric winalda clint dempsey that came from a generation of guys that are a little bit uh you know not as overcoached as I would say. So there's an argument there for, you know, guided discovery and putting people in environments that cause them to, to fight and work and figure it out on their own that I think uh, is missing a little bit in the modern structure. Yeah. Well, that's fair. Um, 
I think that, I mean, I, I don't know how much of a difference there is regionally across the United States. I know that there are kind of pockets across the country from a youth soccer perspective where they're kind of hotbeds of talent and, and things like that. Um, my own personal experience, I, I grew up in Richmond, played for the, for the kickers youth clubs, actually. Um, so some of the people that kind of impacted me the most, I had some really incredible coaches. I was super lucky. Um, I had Sasha Gores for a couple of years. who was a great player for the pro team. And I had Lee Kalashaw, uh, I guess for a year, a year and a half. Um, and they were great in terms of development from Lee, especially from kind of like an academic perspective. I, I mean, I remember one practice very vividly. Maybe it wasn't going so well, and he sent us home with homework. Uh, he wanted us to watch. I'm trying to remember what the game was now, but he wanted us to watch a full 90 minutes mm -hmm. of, I think it was a Barcelona game. Maybe it was the Champions League final, them against United. Um, and he wanted us to watch the whole game from a tactical perspective. And this is when we were 14 and 15. Um, so to hear you talk about not having a, a coach who had played the game before or coached the game before until you were 17, I think it's super interesting. It just kind of paints a super vivid narrative about the differences in generation. And, but I mean, not to minimize that at all. I think it's, it's super interesting and just a different way of looking at things. You know, it's uh you know, you, you hit on something in, in your generation. Uh, you guys can find football from pretty much any league in the world. Well, not right now, uh, right. but <laughs> from former games, but you can, you can pretty much watch any league in the world. And, you know, when I was a, when I was a, a young kid, I had to get up on Sunday mornings at 4 a.m. to watch soccer made in Germany from Toby Charles because <laughs> there wasn't any uh, soccer on TV. You know, now yeah. less there's – the EPL, there's La Liga, there's, you know, you can find the Argentine League if you want, the Bundesliga. And it's uh, it's an amazing way for kids to learn. And, you know, we highly encourage the pro players. Obviously, they have to watch stuff consistently. But, you know, in the Development Academy, we made sure that guys were watching film all the time, both personally and uh, tactically. So it's a huge tool, man. And what a great advantage yeah. technology has given this new generation of player. Yeah, it really has. It's, it's pretty crazy. So... You talk about as you go up through high school and through college, at what point did you know coaching is the way I want to go after I'm done playing? I think that's an interesting question to ask players. Uh, you know, I, I think it started with Wade Weber in high school. I think he 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 gave me the bug. I, I was coaching youth players even when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. Uh, Clive was obviously an incredible teacher. And Brian Smetzer, the head coach of the Sounders, you know, working with him and watching how he managed people uh was an amazing thing that you know a locker room is a special place you know whether that's uh yeah. 14 year old kids or are professional players and you have a profound impact and there's a responsibility that goes with that and uh, i've always taken that very seriously so uh, i knew uh, through my playing days that i would be involved in the game i'm just i'm a soccer lifer and i i knew i would be involved in it you know i i you know i got a degree in organizational communications you know it's a bachelor of science uh, I went after my licensing right away. Um, so I've, I've always been a student of the game and wanted to, to give something back. And hopefully I'm a better coach than I was a player, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. You uh, have some pretty impressive stats. I've well, I, I appreciate that. I was what you call a worker bee. I scored goals. <laughs> I had to work for every inch of what I got. I think, uh, yeah. I think hard work really pays off. Yeah. Wow, but that's clearly a – kind of a life lesson that you can take into your coaching career as well. So, so talked about high school, talked about college a little bit, getting into your coaching career. Um, can you just run us through kind of the progression of, of where you were and what time and things like that? Um, I had played in MLS. I had, uh, you know, dabbled. I went, I went over to England for four months in between the 96 and 97 season. I'd gone to South Korea to play a little bit. I played in Mexico a little before the MLS started. And, you know, as you get older, you, 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 you don't necessarily, you aren't able to do things at the same level that you were when you were younger. And I was a super fit, fast guy. And when you get older, those two, those are the two things that go away. So <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I went back to Seattle uh, to play with the uh, A-League team at the time. You know, it's this, the equivalent of our USL championship now. And uh, 
at one point I was playing for the Sounders. I was coaching at the University of Washington. I was running a youth club uh, in Highline and I was coaching my old high school program at Thomas Jefferson all at the same time uh, <laughs> and going after my licensing to, to, to you know, get certified. So I knew what I wanted to do. Um, Brian Smetzer gave me a great opportunity to be uh, the assistant coach with the, with the Sounders, um, you know, in 06, 07 and 08. Uh, and then into 09, we, we turned MLS, you know, we won a, a national championship in 07 and it was a really awesome experience for me. I learned a lot that year about what being a professional coach is, uh, and how to manage people and stuff. So, you know, I, I've been lucky, I've been exposed to some good guys, but you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting. You know, there, there's something to take from every single coach and, uh, you know, good or bad, you know, to, to, to come right. up on flavor. So it's kind of the pathway. Yeah. That's how I got into yeah. it. That's cool. One thing that I do really want to focus on today is your time with the Guam national team. Um, <laughs> when you came into the club and I first heard that, that was the first thing that stuck out to me. I mean, I, you've had a, a glittering career so far, but to hear that you were the head coach of a national team, I think is super interesting and maybe something that a lot of people don't necessarily know right off the bat. Can you tell me what that was like? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty crazy. Well, you know, I've had some varied experience with U.S. soccer and youth national pools and teams and that type of stuff. But I had a good friend uh, that I had coached with in Washington that I'd helped get a job, a pretty big job in Washington State with Washington Youth Soccer. And he he had moved on uh, because he had been the head coach of the Bahamas national team at one point. And he had a connection and went to Guam. And then when he moved on from Guam, he went to China to coach uh, professionally you know, his, his aspiration is to coach at the highest level around the world. And he's an Englishman. And he, anyway, he, he called me and said, look, we're, you know, we're getting ready for qualifying and, you know, not to get through all the particulars, but um, uh, the East Asian football uh, federation, the EAFF is a, a tournament that you go through to then get into qualifying basically uh, to get to the world cup. And Guam's not exactly the hugest <laughs> uh, island or, or group of players, uh, but that they, ha they have their own representation. And I had this, uh, so I got the call. I, I took the opportunity. I, I went on flights for like 15 hours to get over there and meet with everybody. But what's really interesting to Guam is most of the players that are a part of that team are playing elsewhere it's very rare for them to be on the island. So, you know, training camps are usually in the location of where you have games, you know, weeks prior or however much time you can get. So I had division three college players uh, playing. I had kids in high school from Guam playing. I had guys in professional, top professional leagues like AJ De La Garza from Houston and MLS was on my team and Ryan Guy who played for the revolution, you know, so you had this huge disparity in, levels and you were asking this group of players in a two-week period of time to to get bonded to get tactically astute to then compete against you know north korea in a qualifying game it, uh, it was a it was an insane experience i'll say that yeah but, but awesome i learned a lot and the guys are great and you know cool place huh well that yeah that's that's even crazier than i thought about it at first <laughs> when you talk about it in more detail um so i'm gonna make a, a big leap comparison here this is kind of my hot take for the day. Um, so I kind of, I see international soccer and soccer coaching um, from an international perspective as, as similar. Obviously there's a huge disparity in level. Um, so please don't mistake me for that. Um, between international soccer and high school soccer. And maybe that's just cause I'm a high school soccer coach and I, I that's kind of the world that I'm living in at this point. But the reason I say that is because you're given a population that you can pull from and there's no signing players. There's no trying to get players from other clubs to join you. It's just, you have this population. What can you pull from that population and kind of bring together to, to, to form a cohesive unit. Um, and so I think this is an area that I can, that I can really learn from you having had that experience and different experiences throughout your life. How important, well, let me back up. Do you agree, first and foremost? I, I, what are your thoughts on that? I will tell you something that you don't know about me, Will. I, uh, I, we won the 2005 uh, 
4A, which is the highest level high school state championship in Washington State with Thomas Jefferson High School. And Lamar Nagel, who had a 10-year career in MLS and played for the Sounders, played for Montreal, played for DC United, he was my star player. Uh, but I didn't know that until halfway through the season. I ended up having to remove a player due to discipline who was by far the best soccer player. And to your point, you in high school, you have so many variables. If kids aren't passing classes or or truant or do something, you lose them. And you might have a ninth grader who's really small but a, a brilliant player, but in high school, he'll get run over. And you have to manage all of these pieces. And that national team experience was very similar to that. You have people coming from all walks of life and you have to, you have to mix this stew together and find success. I I'll tell you that winning that, that, that championship was one of the, one of the funnest um, championships that I was involved in as a player or as a coach, because of that, what you're alluding to, you have to find a way to, to get the best out of the ecology, right? So if you look at the ecology and the ecology says you have two good strikers, but you want to play a 4-3-3, you're probably going to adjust your formation based on the fact that the ecology dictates that you got to get your best guys on the field. You know, that's really a philosophy that that I believe in in coaching. You, you got to get your best group of people on the field. And high school soccer, national pools, uh, yes, the levels are different, but you have to find a way to put that all together and be successful. And it's uh, it's a challenge, man. That's the best part about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's so interesting to hear you say. And I remember when I was playing at Goblin, which is where I coach now, a lot of the conversations that I had with my teammates and with the coaches was we just have to get the best 11 players on the field. And it's not so much the system that we play in the beginning. You know, we can fine tune that as we go along. But especially at the high school level, I think it's so important just to get the best 11 players that you have on the field. And, you know, I could I could come into this season if I wanted to and be like, OK, well, we're going to play a three, five, two. And, you know, that's my philosophy and that's how I want to play because that's how I see the game. But, you know, if we don't have wing backs or we don't have two strikers, there's no point in shoehorning players into those that system that's not going to suit them. So that's one of the things that I've had to kind of learn in my early coaching career um, is that it's way more important to look at, like you said, the ecology and the players that you have available to you as opposed to. I'm the soccer purist. I'm going to play this system because I think it's, you know, the right way to go about it. Um, I think that's a really good lesson, good lesson to have. Well, I, you know, it's it's interesting too because you're you're talking about youth players as well, and you have to make a decision with uh, when you're developing players. You know, high school is a little bit more of an end product of the youth. Uh, but you have to make a choice. I mean, are you are you working to maximize the individual player development or are you trying to win games? And I think that uh, if you're trying to win games, a lot of times you skip pieces in player development. And when you're trying to develop players, you can have both. You probably have to wait for the results till a little bit later uh, because in order to maximize a player's ability to grow and meet what they could, you have to put them in situations that they're going to fail. And you have to be okay with that. You have to look at it and go, you know, we're going to win in a year or two years uh, if that's your end goal, but you're going to have to make the players or help the players become the best that they could be. And it's a tough one, man. I, I think a lot of people struggle, especially in the U.S., even now, even with all of the the academies and all these things. I mean, I think academy is an overused word because uh, academy really alludes to a methodology to get to an end point. And a lot of people roll out youth soccer teams and call them academies, but what they really uh, – I think everybody's well-meaning, but at the end of the day, academy alludes to developing players to the max of their ability. And, you know, to circle back to high school, I think a lot of the guys that uh, I had opportunities to play high school for me, it was right on that cusp before the academy started. Uh, I got the best players. I think a lot because the academy excluded that opportunity for a long time. You know, high school, you had the other issue of you may not have all the best players in your high school and your team because they weren't allowed to play. So, right, right. Yeah. And one last thing before we move on, um, a question that kind of popped into my head based on your, your talk about end product versus development, going back to your days with the Guam national team, it seems to me, and maybe this is, this is wrong. Um, but it seems to me that international level soccer is all about end product. I mean, you don't have a ton of time to develop players. You don't have a ton of time to develop a team. So as a coach who, talks a lot about, um, you know, the process and development. How was that for you? I mean, not necessarily being able to coach individual talent, just trying to put 11 players on the field to win a game. How was that for you? 
Well, uh, first, international soccer is absolutely about end product. It's about winning. That's it. I mean, and the people that say differently uh, are wrong. <laughs> I would argue that <laughs> you're trying to you're trying to win a World Cup. Okay, and and how you do that, you know, you want to do it with style. You want it to be pretty. You want it to be your way. But you know, I use the analogy of the Richmond Kickers. I have a specific way that I want our team to play. We are working in club soccer to have a way so people know our style, our brand. They they know what the Richmond Kickers are about. That's a three year plus project, and it takes a lot of time. When you're talking about a national team, you you don't have that time. And back to the ecology, you might want to play a, a tic tac soccer like the Brazil or Brazilians do, or the or the Spaniards did to to brilliance. But the Spaniards were able to do that and win World Cups because. Barcelona and all of the clubs in that country really bought in and it, it was cultural. You know, you, you take a, a, a team like our national team for me, it's really difficult because there's 7,000 different ideas in Virginia on how to play soccer, much less this huge country to try to bring a national team together and say, this is our brand. You know, Greg Bearhalter has a pretty hard job and yeah. he's trying to institute that, but to do it over three week increments of training, Man, it's it's going to take a long time. You know, I I'm again, I'm an ecological coach. I look at it and say, I have, you know, four of the best strikers in the world. I'm b definitely going to be playing a much more attacking style uh, brand of football uh, within my philosophy because I have those pieces at my disposal. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, I, I, like you alluded to there, the the relationship between domestic leagues and the clubs that are in them, and the national team. I think maybe gets overlooked or certainly I have overlooked it in the past, but I think it's hugely important in terms of international success. So maybe we just cracked the code. Maybe, maybe that's why the U S hasn't won yet. <laughs> Again, you know, you're asking, and these are my opinions based on, what I'm saying, but I, I don't think that anybody's going to argue that international football is about winning. If you have yeah. to, if you have to park the bus and counterattack to get points, you know, the Italians have won some world cups doing it. You know, people will say, oh, it's not as pretty as soccer. Well, guess what? They uh, they still get the opportunity to hold a World Cup trophy. Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, so moving on a little bit, and we've touched on this pretty regularly throughout. So this, this whole academy thing. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting for me because this will affect directly my coaching. And I'm sure it will affect directly your coaching as well. Um, for those who are unaware, the, the U.S. Development Academy has announced that they will not be going forward into the future. Um, it was a financial decision based on all the effects of this pandemic. Um, so for the youth soccer landscape and professionally and pretty much just the soccer landscape in the U.S., it seems to me this is humongous news. Um, your thoughts on it, first and foremost. Well, you could press record now and we could go for a long time. You know, I was the uh, the academy director with the Seattle Sounders for eight years. I, I was involved with the first set of the formation license of the e EFCL uh, with MLS, which is the initiative to to basically bring the level of educating and coaching up uh, within the academy system. And, and um, so I have some intimate knowledge and, you know, it, it, to start, the first thing is the word academy is a very interesting thing. Academy alludes to having a methodology that everybody, coach, player, uh, parent, staff, administrator understands. This is how we develop players. This is the phases and principles that we teach. This is the pedagogy we use and everybody uses it and there's benchmarks and it's measurable and it's incremental. And you know, I think there's a lot of people that just slap the word academy onto a project they're doing. And um, the, the point is professional football, these MLS teams, they have an end goal with their academies. They're developing players for their first team and to sell on. I mean, that's professional sports. And there, you know, a lot of these MLS teams, if you look at FC Dallas, they've done a, an amazing job, you know, Oscar Perea and, and Luchi Gonzalez. I mean, I, they're the, they're the, re, they're the shining light in the whole academy system with all of the homegrowns that play with their first team. Um, you know, in Seattle, it was a bummer for me when I moved on, because if you were able to keep all of the academy guys that had graduated out of our academy and moved into the USL and MLS, it, the 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 second team for Sa Seattle, the Defiance now would be unbelievable. Not that it's not good. There's some great players and they're doing a great job. But 
you have guys like Jordan Schweitzer and Sean O'Coley and Darwin Jones that are that are all stars in the USL Championship, and there's guys littered all over the place that are all Seattle products. And I think it took a while for for MLS to really get what they wanted it to be, but they nailed it, man. The the, the amount of MLS homegrowns that are having huge impacts in MLS right now are it's unbelievable this past year, and. I think the development academy, to be honest, with U.S. soccer uh, as a whole, uh, it's a bummer that it 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 shut down. But the MLS teams and academies are really driving player development now. They they really yeah. are. There's there's the ECNL guys, you know, that they've done. A, it's another amazing opportunity for kids, and everybody is well-meaning and doing a a, a good job trying to help kids get better. Uh, but the MLS teams have really started to dominate and develop these players. And, you know, there are a lot of good players in the, in these other national leagues. Uh, but you know, it needed to be driven by the top pro leagues in the country. And hopefully the USL will graduate into that in, in the coming years. But again, academies have to be about the development of players and maximizing potential based on a methodology that's succinct and scientific. If it's not, you're just putting a soccer team out there and saying, let's go fellas. I mean, you can't, yeah, there has to be science to it. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't know that I have much more to add than that. <laughs> That's a pretty comprehensive report. Um, but how do you, or do you see this affecting um, the pathway that players will take? I mean, presumably the, the clubs that are labeled academy will just move into a new league and there'll just be a new kind of administration behind it. I, I'm not sure if that'll happen. What, what do you think? Well, it's it's already happening. You know, uh, uh, a lot of teams that kind of got stuck in a in a bit of a vacuum here when the U.S. Development Academy shut down are jumping into uh, the ECNL, which is the other alternative. Uh, so I don't think that it will look a lot different. You'll have a lot of good competing standalone youth clubs doing their thing, and then Major League Soccer said that they're going to do their own league. And everybody, I, I've heard from Christian Lavers at the ECNL and from, I've talked to many of the MLS people, everybody wants to be inclusive and work together. So to your point, US, the USDA shutting down, I think there's an opportunity here to, to regionalize competition and bring the cost down. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many MLS teams operating now and now so many USL Championship and USL League One teams that have a youth connection. And if everybody works together, whether it's ECNL, uh, MLS, or whatever, there's a new entity. If everybody works together, you can regionalize the competition and still get the level you need to maximize player development. And if you do that, then you don't necessarily have to get on airplanes all the time, which I think people are going to be more and more weary of based on what we're currently doing. Right. So yeah. I think that there's an awesome opportunity for everybody to work together here uh, with the shutdown. Uh, it's just cooler heads prevail. So hopefully everyone works together. Yeah. Well, that is, I learned a lot. I know a lot more about the whole situation now. So I appreciate that. And like you said, I think we could have press record and go all day about the development Academy stuff. So, um, but I think now's a good time to, to stop it for this week. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for the information and the news on the Academy and how it might affect me and how it'll affect you. And, um, I'm just looking forward to the, the next one. Appreciate it, man. Stay safe, yep. everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. All righty. See ya.